Hello, sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. This week, we'll be talking, well, 2022. It is upon us. It is our first official podcast of 2022, and what a year it is going to be. Uh, We'll be talking transfer news, because there's all sorts of transfer news, whether it's overseas uh, or here, incoming, outgoing, all sorts of stuff like that. MLS moves that are happening on the field, off the field, Pulisic, Manchester United, don't look up, AFCON, predictability, Wolverines, best manager in the world, solo cups, and so much more. But first joining me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how are you on this Monday, January 3rd in the year 2022? Two. I can't believe my eyes. Uh, we are in this year. You look rested. You look healthy. You look tanned and ready to go for this new year. We have both returned successfully from the great straight, uh, great state of Florida. I had a wonderful vacation. Uh, I'm assuming you did too. Uh, it was excellent. Now, listen, I'm here today, but uh, because we have such a busy year ahead, I did consider opting out of this podcast. But uh, ultimately, <laughs> I. I uh, I saw you You got caught up in that debate on Twitter. Even though you're not a college football guy, this whole players opting out of bowl games has even hit your radar. Yeah, I mean, so uh, we'll get to what I watched, which was minimal over the break. Uh, there wasn't a lot of, you know, traditional type of Netflix uh, television watching. But what I did watch was a tremendous amount of football, both collegiate and uh, and NFL. And so I I got, you know, once you start watching it and you're, there's a steady diet of it, you kind of get into all the narratives. And so when you know, uh, what was it? Kurt Herbstreit or whatever starts talking about, you know, do that. Does this generation actually care? You know, to my little brain, it was, well, yeah, they want to win and they want to be champions. It was it, the irony of, uh, cause look, I can grumpy old man with the best of them, but this was so strange to me because really this was an older guy arguing that somehow players used to not want to win or used to not want to be champions. I mean, the whole point, the reason why I watched the final four, I don't know what you call it, college playoffs or whatever thing, because I was told these are the best four teams. Now I know it's debatable. I know it's subjective, but these are the best four teams. And so I tuned in for that. The reason why I watched the Rose bowl was because I was in a household of Buckeye fans. So yeah, that was a little bit strange. I didn't quite understand it. And I injected myself in there probably where where I didn't need to be, but um, that, that, athletes, regardless of what level, regardless if they're paid or not, and I know even that's up for debate, uh, not up for debate, they're actually paid now uh, in different ways, in different uh, avenues. But but regardless, it should not surprise Kurt Herbstreit or anybody else that players want to be crowned the best. They want to, uh, you know, they want to play in the big games and they want to play in big tournaments. And the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the question of players sitting out I mean, that's, and I said this on Twitter, I said, look, that that's, you know, that's a risk return type of scenario, right? Risk, reward, profit, uh, you know, cost analysis, whatever you want to do it, which by the way, you learn oftentimes in college about these types of things. And so I, I completely get it. You created this monster and now you're, you're, now you're angry that they're actually taming this monster and using it to their advantage. I don't know. Anyway, uh, but speaking of the final four, Mossy, I did sit down, and so, so I since I watched so much of this, uh, the American football, uh, I did see, sit down, and, and as I was told, like I said, this was the best four teams. Uh, listen, I, I do not claim to be an expert when it comes to football in general, nor your Wolverines of Michigan, okay? But they looked thoroughly outmatched, my friend. And I know you went to the game. I, I trust you at least had a good experience, although the performance on the field was absolutely atrocious. They had no business being in that game. They were completely outplayed, completely outcoached. And really, then when I go and watch something like uh, Ohio State play in the Rose Bowl, I mean, once again, in my little mind, I'm making a case that it might be the final four and theoretically the best four teams in the country, but that if, if Michigan is one of the best four teams in the country, then something is wrong with the final four. No, absolutely. It was a disaster. Uh, the, the trip overall was great. I had so much fun with my family down there, you know, and it's funny. Um, it's been really cold in LA. So yep. it was a rare instance of leaving Los Angeles to go somewhere else and having that snowbird feeling of escaping the cold to go somewhere warm. 
Uh, so the trip was great. I, uh, I saw some college buddies down there who went to the game. I had dinner with our good friend, Jason Wormser. Uh, good to see him. Uh, but yeah, the one low light was the game itself. And listen, uh, in the back of my mind, I kind of had a sneaking suspicion this might happen because um, the SEC conference is just operating on a different level right now. The only Big Ten team that recruits at a level and has the athletes to go toe-to-toe with these big-time SEC teams is Ohio State. So uh, I think Ohio State would have definitely put up a better fight, and they have in past years. They've even beaten SEC teams and won a national championship. So, um, yeah, I mean, Michigan, whenever Ohio State slips up like they, they did this year and a different Big Ten team gets in there, this is usually what happens because uh, this was just uh, – you know, completely out of our depth. I mean, there's no no doubt about it. From start to finish, it was a shellacking. All right. Uh, I know people are, are, are turning off uh, or at least uh, fading out when we talk too much about American football. But it, it, it did, you know, it, it made the news. And then the Antonio Brown thing. Is that his name? Antonio Brown? Is that the, the guy? Correct. Yeah. Holy cow, this guy. I mean, uh, you know, it was this slap shot-esque type of moment. He's quite a character, this, uh, this, this young man. Evidently, he's had some problems in the past, both on and off the field. So this is not necessarily a surprise. I hope whatever's ailing him. I hope he gets, you know, the help that he needs because he's, he's got some problems right there. And uh, football, I mean, let's be honest. If he, if he wasn't able to catch the ball and they told me that last week he caught, caught like 14 passes or something like that. If he wasn't able to play football and catch the ball, I, I fear for where this guy, this guy would be. But anyway, that was, that was a nutty thing to, to see happen on the football field. Did you watch anything? Because I, I watched, like I said, not a lot, but I did watch something that I do, that I do want to mention. Did you watch anything over the break? Uh, no, just last night when I got back, I watched a uh, curb because I had fallen behind one episode. So I watched, I watched the last two episodes of this season. I thought curb finished out pretty strong. That whole, uh, Colonel Vinman thing in the season finale, I thought was pretty hilarious. So, uh, solid end of the season for curb, but yeah, beyond that, uh, nothing else. Have you seen this movie? Don't look up. I have not. You have. All right. So this is, uh, I think it's a made for, well, maybe it was made to be put at one of those where it was made to be put out in the theater and then <laughs> the world took over and, and our lives all changed. And so uh, you can find this out on uh, Netflix uh, over there. It, 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 it is, it's a really strange movie. Okay. It's a, it's a satire and um, it's, the, the satire is, you know, poking fun and, and, and pointing out, the ridiculousness of the world in which we live in terms of what we put value on relative to what we don't, um, how we are influenced by, by news and how we are uh, taken in different directions, all that kind of stuff. Great cast, including Leonardo DiCaprio, Jennifer Lawrence, uh, Kate Blanchett, Meryl Streep, Jonah Hill, it goes on and on and on. I, 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 I don't yet know if I actually liked this or not. I was worried that it was going to be really kind of, you know, wokish and and want to one side or the other and, you know, virtue signaling kind of BS and out there. And, and it wasn't, it didn't, it, it, I think it poked fun and satirized a lot of stuff that was out there that is, um, that is universal. Um, and then it just kind of goes, <laughs> goes off the rails. So I think it was well-intentioned, but I'm still not sure if I like it. It's, it's one of those where I don't like to watch things multiple times, but I feel like I should go back and watch it again and on the second viewing, see how I react to it. I do, I do recommend it because, like I said, there's some great actors, um, and it's an interesting take on the world in which we live in right now where it, it's kind of ripped from the headlines as to, uh, as to what is happening um, and they use, you know, kind of a, a trope, you know, with uh, the end of the world and the destruction of the world to point out all of the hypocrisy and the ridiculousness that exists uh, in the world. In many ways, they do it, but that's that's a hard task to do in a movie without being trite and ridiculous in, in and of itself uh, or just not being funny. And I think, you know, it, it was funny where it needed to be. It was interesting where it needed to be. It wasn't overly sanctimonious. Um, which I think is a real problem and danger in a movie like that. So all in all, it was good. And I just want to kind of watch it again. So I recommend that for the, uh, the folks out there. All right, Mossy, anything else uh, before we move on? We That's are, it. as I said, in, in 2022 here. So it is a brand new year. We are, we're not in our studio, although we're back in Los Angeles. We're not in our studio. We will be back, uh, I think, next week if all goes as planned. But once again, <laughs> you got to be able to bob and weave. 
uh, and we have been, uh, been able to do that for the last couple of years, and we will continue to do so. So I'm at my house, you're at my uh, at your house for this uh, for this recording. You ready to light this candle? Let's do it. All right, we're going to jump right into it because the other football part of my viewing experience over the break obviously was a whole lot of what was going on around the world. And in the second segment, we're going to get to all the different things that happened in particular over in uh, England that just kind of not monopolizes, actually uses in a really smart and strategic way the festive period to just give us a steady dose and diet uh, of soccer. But having said that, there were all sorts of things that were happening, uh, even you know places uh, like the United States and Canada and in regards to uh, Major League Soccer, and so, including some what possibly could be monumental type of moments uh, and signings. Now, the rumors regarding Ricardo Pepe. Should we start there, Mossy? What do you think? Uh, sure. Yeah. Pepe and DK, I think we can. Pepe and DK. Yeah. Cause those are the, those were the big news items to come out of American soccer. And for two players that uh, have come out of the American soccer uh, system and two players that we have known, two players that have been really interesting in where they are today, where they were, let's say a year ago and how much has changed in how we look at them. The, the fact that they have, they have, uh, that they have interest should be of no surprise to anybody. We've seen Daryl DK already has had a spell over in the championship and has done very, very well there. We saw what he did with the national team. Then he kind of petered out. And while there was all the talk about the transfer, it, it ended up not happening in the moment that we thought it was going to, it ends up happening right now. A little bit of a, you know, maybe of a, of, of a letdown in terms of ultimately what it is, but still, uh, Daryl DK gets transferred from uh, from Orlando and signs with West Brom uh, from Orlando City. Nine point five rumored uh, transfer fee, so good money when it comes to that. The you know the the other news and probably the bigger news from a precedent set, uh, st- setting standpoint is Ricardo Pepe. Right now, arguably the number nine for Greg Berhalter. All sorts of attention given what he has done in MLS, but also being the starter for. Uh, for the national team, even at the age of 18. And, you know, as I said on Twitter this morning, um, when it comes to Ricardo Pepe, um, timing is everything. Had Ricardo Pepe been doing the exact same things five years ago, or who knows, maybe five years in the future, things may have turned out very, very different. But ultimately, he gets to go to the Bundesliga, which we know well, and we also know is a place that is very receptive to young talent in general, but also American talent. And so that checks a box in that it is, it is good. Now uh, the Bergs were after him. Wolfsburg ends up winning uh, out on this. And the rumored transfer fee is around $20 million. That's good for Ricardo Pepe in terms of the place that he is going in terms of the Bundesliga. I don't know how much he is going to play or what type of play he's going to get, but certainly if you sign somebody that big in a record uh, signing for uh, for uh, this uh, for Augsburg, so I said uh, Wolfsburg, I got the Bergs messed up. Uh, for Augsburg, a record signing like that, you got to feel that they're signing him to help them. And it's going to be a, a slog and a relegation fight that we are seeing when it comes, uh, comes to Augsburg. But congratulations to him. The precedent that it sets when it comes to the price. Remember when we were talking about DK, you remember... Commissioner Garber constantly throwing out that $20 million number 20. Well, they finally evidently have gotten it for an American player developed in the U S and that sets up well for, uh, for the future. Initial thoughts. Let's start with, uh, with Pepe when it comes to uh, this transfer to, uh, to Augsburg for $20 million. Well, I'm going to combine the two actually. Uh, And look, I've said this before when it comes to young players, uh, there's no definite right or wrong path. There, there are exceptions to every rule. There, there are examples of successes or f- and failures every which way you do it. But generally speaking, if you're a young player, I think, A, you need to go somewhere where you're going to get playing time. And then if you're a striker, uh, you need to go somewhere where you're going to get service. So I judge both these transfers through that lens. And in DK's case, I think he checks all the boxes here because – He's going to a West Brom team that's uh, near the top of the championship, fighting for promotion. Uh, But you look at the depth chart, he's definitely going to play. I mean, the general consensus seems to be that he'll walk right into the starting lineup. Uh, He's going to a league where he flourished in last year to play for the same manager, Ishmael, who was in charge of Barnsley and has now moved to West Brom. And you look at the numbers, 
Uh, West Brom are second in the championship and expected goals, but only seventh in goal scored, which speaks to the fact that they've been creating chances and the strikers just haven't have been putting the ball in. Now, I will say there's some disagreement there because you read some articles from people that actually watch the team and they say, no, actually, they've been quite boring uh, this season and haven't created that many chances. So I don't know. It gets into that analytics versus eye test, but I'm going to trust the stats there and feel like that's a team where he is going to see plenty of the ball and get some chances. So I think in his case, uh, this is a pretty safe move. I, I'd be stunned if this doesn't work out. Um, and, and, you know, it's going to be interesting the second half of the season in England to contrast DK with Josh Sargent, because there's a guy that felt like, oh, I can't turn down a move to the Premier League. But now he's saddled on being on the worst team in the Premier League. And I know there's a school of thought. You're almost better off as a striker being on one of the better teams of a lower league than being on one of the worst teams of a higher league. And so, sure, Sargent has the status of being a Premier League player, while DK is, quote unquote, flumming it in the championship. But it'd be interesting to see which one is the happier of the two the next few months, given the two teams they're playing on. Um, in Pepe's case, uh, I think definitely from a playing time standpoint, there's no issue. I mean, looking at that Augsburg team, he should have no problem getting on the field. But there is a question about the other part I said about the service. You look at the numbers, they're near the bottom of the Bundesliga, 15th place. They're one point above the relegation playoff spot. And boy, they're in the bottom of the league in, in all the offensive categories, goals, expected goals, chances created, shots on target. So there's a little bit of that Sergeant at Werder Bremen concern. So that'd be the only thing I'd look at there with that transfer. And, and maybe you'd, be, you'd worry about that. I mean, look, it, it, there, there's a there's a potential for when it comes to our striker core, okay? Come this fall, a couple months before the World Cup, knock on wood, we qualify, but we qualify. That striker core for what is, in a lot of people's minds, the most exciting um, and talented group that we have certainly seen in a long time and for many people that we have ever seen. And yet this dearth of talent up top, there's a potential that the starter for the U.S. team come that World Cup will be in the championship of either DK or uh, let's be honest, Sergeant, if he continues uh, 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 continues there. Um, and when it comes to... Uh, you know, like like we mentioned, Ricardo Pepe, there's a good chance that they're going to go down. So he's in the second division when it comes to the Bundesliga. And God forbid it's Jossi Zardes because he plays MLS. And that's, that's a you know, <laughs> that, that in and of itself is an indictment, right, to a lot of people. So, and and once again, you have heard me say that, that form is fallacy. And the perception of a player relative to where he or she is playing or the the, the level is does not always equate with the reality when they get with the national team. So none of that precludes any of these players I mentioned from having a breakout tournament and being the man when it comes to scoring goals up top. But again, I go back to uh, Ricardo Pepe, whose, whose life is forever changed because of not just talent, but also some very, very good timing. I think it was strategic. Um, and I think it was probably smart in this in this step, and he probably had other other offers and other opportunities, uh, other opportunities out there. Um, and if he is, from a production standpoint, looking like Josh Sargent come the fall, it, it still would not surprise me if there aren't some more twists and turns when it comes to that number nine, and that what we are envisioning right now is very, very different than the reality come November of 2022 in Qatar when that World Cup starts and the U.S. steps out on the field on, uh, you know, for uh, against whoever it ends up being. But, you know, these are these are good things. Again, this is this is churning it. This is, you know, getting that pump going of talent, having people look at American talent and especially talent that is playing in the United States, in Canada right now, and when it comes to Major League Soccer or USL, looking at it and saying that this is quality. I can find good talent and paying for it because somebody asked me today about the development, youth development out there. Look, there are teams that are spending a tremendous amount of money in the United States uh, that, to develop their talent. They're not necessarily seeing a return. Some of them are doing it better than others. You you mentioned Dallas. Uh, certainly, they are looking right now at their coffers pretty full with what they with the business they've done just over the last year, and that's that's a credit to them. Now, the other side of it is their their actual team on the field and the people that are paying good money to watch FC Dallas. Um, they're not necessarily getting a value in return for that. But in terms of the development, 
everything seems to be going, going their way. And MLS is looking at that saying, all right, great. We want people coming to our marketplace first and foremost and paying that money and paying fair uh, amounts. Uh, and this $20 million price tag right now, there's, there's going to be a lot of pressure on the player. And for him to come good and him, for him to kind of justify this new number. And we remember when, uh, you know, when Josie Altidore first went and, the, you know, the $10 million barrier and all these different barriers. But this is this is what it's about. And who knows, maybe this leads to another player going for 25 and going for 30 and going for 40. And I know we've had uh, Miguel Almiron, but I'm talking about a developed player from the United States, uh, from Canada, that is developed oftentimes in Major League Soccer through these development systems that we're talking about. That's that's the proof of concept that you want, and that's the business associated that you want to continue to make sure that th that, that teams around the world, when they are looking into that market and, and they're shopping, that they go to the United States, that they go to Canada. But yeah, I, I do think it's interesting. Deadspin had an article that said the U.S. number nine race has officially moved to Europe. And, and, and there's some real truth to that. And, you know, when you look at the inherent risks in any kind of move of a young American player going to Europe, does it make you nervous in a World Cup year when this is essentially the make or break position for the U.S. national team? Does part of you wish these guys had maybe waited a year and, and the safer choice would have been for Pepe to spend another season at MLS, DK to spend another season with Orlando, and, and then perhaps move after the World Cup, which if, they, if the U.S. qualifies and those guys played well at the World Cup, their value would have been even higher? Or, or are, you, are you looking at the upside here of, these guys potentially going to Europe and doing well would give them even more confidence heading into the World Cup. Yeah, I I, I tend to look on the, the a positive side, and I'm optimistic that even even if they're struggling to score goals, even if they're in a relegation fight, there is still value to that. You know, somebody asked me, and I know we're going to talk about Christian Pulisic later on in the in the show, but somebody had asked me if his drought that he was on um, was was a problem in terms of his development. I, I do tend to think that especially these guys that have now been, you know, ingrained and ingratiated into Greg Berhalter's team and what it means to play for the national team. I think that there is a, you know, not necessarily what Kerb Herbstreit was talking, talking about, but more so like the, this, this enjoyment, this, that, that does transcend the actual money part of it of representing your country. And in particular representing the United States for these players that are going off into foreign lands and you know, chasing their dreams and and working hard and having ups and downs and doing all that, getting back on that plane. And you know, even back in the day when I was doing it, there was never a moment that I was more excited and proud than stepping on that plane, knowing I was going back to play for this team that meant so much to me. And I still think that 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 lives in players like Christian Pulisic. That that will live in a player like Ricardo uh, uh, Ricardo Pepe, despite his age, despite how young he is. Uh, wanting wanting to do that and so there is a there is a sense that y y a change of scenery and setting and circumstances can bring out the best of players and so again I, it goes back to what i said F form is fallacy not all the time but oftentimes it is so it would not surprise me in the least even if someone like pepe or sergeant uh, or dk are struggling look if they're playing well that's great okay but even if they're not it still wouldn't surprise me if they if they have a good uh, a, a good World Cup. Uh, anything else on these uh, on these moves here? Uh, no, we can move on. Okay. Um, speaking of all right, so that was that's outgoing. Let's let's go. Let's shift to an in uh, incoming thing. Um, and uh, Lorenzo Insigne. All right. Am I saying that correctly, Masi? Bravissimo. Bravissimo. Ah, oh, grazie. Um, all right. So this is. This is big for a number of reasons. Okay, um, this is a, a a proven talent and slash star Italian um, uh, national team player, uh, a winner, a player, uh, uh, not necessarily in the prime of his career, but certainly not over the hill. And really, again, as it often does, it comes down to the money uh, when it comes to uh, this player and what reportedly is being offered for uh, by Toronto. Toronto's back, baby, okay? Toronto is back. If, if you remember, Toronto at one point was the place that changed the landscape of MLS spending. And Tim Laiwiki went up there and 
and whether uh, it was uh, Jovinko, whether it was Josie Altador, whether it was Michael Bradley, the uh, list goes on and on and on. They, they were willing to spend, they had the funds and they went out and they spent well, and it provided us one of the great teams in major league soccer history. Evidently they want to do that again. So much so that they want to not only break the get the bank, but do it in a way that everybody's looking around going, is this true? Because when these numbers started to first fly around and we're talking about $13 million a year net, netto, okay? So, I mean, do the calculation when it comes to the taxes and stuff like that. You're talking up to the $20 million range for a player per season. That blows away anything that we have ever had in the past. Now, it remains to be seen whether those are, whether those are the numbers, but if they are, this is another huge, huge moment for, for the league and what it represents. First off, uh, do you think the numbers are going to be that? Second off, if they are that, is this, is this too much? Is this, is this just dumb at this point? <laughs> I mean, that, that, those are the numbers being reported, so I have no reason to doubt that. Uh, and no, I love this move. Um, and, and one of the things I love about it is that most of the conversation around it has been soccer related. As you know, with signings like Chicharito, I get a little bit uncomfortable when a disproportionate amount of the discourse is about the player's marketing ability. And it's almost like an afterthought whether he performs on the field or not. Insigne is not a sexy name from a marketing standpoint. What's sexy and exciting about this signing is what a good player he is and the impact he could potentially have on the field. And it seems like that's what everybody's talking about. So I like that. And yeah, I mean, on the money, I know there's been this conversation on Twitter that, oh, he's throwing his career away and this is just a cash grab and he's, he's just taking the money and running. And, and you know, somebody like Keith Costigan, who, who tweets too much anyway and then had too much time on his hands <laughs> because he was stuck in a Liverpool hotel room for 10 days. So it was one Twitter rant after another. And he went on a huge rant defending an MLS against that charge. And he thinks it's nonsense and, and snobbish and, and all players sign for money. And why is it when a guy goes to MLS, people talk about how he's only going there for the money and this and that. So you know, as a veteran of these wars who's been defending the league, uh, does that still bother you or no? You kind of roll your eyes at this point when, when, when people talk about that. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I, I will fight the good fight probably till the day that I die, but there certainly is a part of me that has learned, you know, when, when to really go in and when to, I guess, fight another day. Right. Um, and, and it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me anymore. I get it. It's, it's the lowest common denominator and it's, it's easy. It's, it's easy thing uh, to point to. We always knew, okay, that you're not going to attract players. All right. Just because they love North America. Now that is, that is certainly an asset and that is certainly uh, something that you use to your advantage, but ultimately you have to, you have to make it worth their while and you have to do big, bold things. Things and you know Toronto once again evidently is willing is willing to do that. In the same way though that the irony is um, I don't know if it's irony but when when the uh, Michael Bradley and Josie Altador deals happened, the the question was not whether teams should spend big money or if it was good that they're spending big money. That's that's good. My question was these are players that never would have gotten that deal anywhere else. Okay. And so you didn't have to spend that much in order to do it, but there is a value to doing something huge and big and bold and air and, and arrogant to it. I don't know what price you put on that or what value you assign to that, but undoubtedly there is a value to doing, to doing that. To your point here, this is, this is much less about, image the image is in the money yes but the, the, you know this is a this is not a player that everybody is going to recognize this is not a, a worldwide star but this is also money being spent on a goal scorer someone that does the hardest thing that we do and that in and of itself makes it very attractive and immediately if there are dividends to be had they are in the form of highlights and everybody's getting excited and things uh and things can happen up there and you know bob bradley is obviously has come in and said look if i'm going to do this you know, don't waste my time and let's go do some big, bold things. And I, I love, I love that they're doing that up in Toronto. And I can't, I hope that this happens. Um, I actually do hope that the money is associated with that and that people say, wow, that is a, that is a whole nother level. And when you do that, other people are going to come sniffing and 
who knows what this might attract, not, not necessarily uh, for Toronto, but for other teams out there when something like this happens. But the other thing is, and I think that this is where a lot of the lost in translation thing happened and, you know, and Javinko and was talking about different things and, and the way that he, he was talking about MLS. I think ultimately what Javinko would understand and Insigne is, is going to understand very, very quickly is that you're not in Kansas anymore. Okay. You're not in Napoli anymore. You're not, this is a very, very different type of existence on and off the field. Okay. On the field in terms of the competition out there and the travel and the other challenges that you have and the level that you might not know you are actually getting into and the fight that you might not know that you're actually uh, getting into. And that's, that's going to be good. I think he is going to become not just a better player, but I think he's going to become a better person for this adventure that he is going on. And I, I appreciate and respect people that want to kind of get out of their comfort zone a little bit and do things. Now he's being paid handsomely to get out of that comfort zone. That doesn't always happen, but if he can have the best of both worlds, both get out of, out of his comfort zone and be challenged in a way and a unique way that he's never been challenged before and get paid a load of money for it. Wow. All right. Sign him up. And it looks like the, that, 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 that's something that that's a challenge that he is up for uh, right now, but ultimately he's like every other player score I, the goal. I know- I know Jovinko is being held up as a cautionary tale as to what could happen to Insigne's international career, but it's a little bit different. Um, when Jovinko came to Toronto, he was languishing on the bench at Juventus and pretty much out of the picture with the Italian national team. And then he did what he did with Toronto. And obviously folks in MLS wanted him to get called up based on that. And he did get a call up here and there, but for the most part, he was left out in the cold and, and two straight Italy managers, Antonio Conti and Giampiero Ventura took shots at MLS. They said, it doesn't matter what he's doing in that league. That league doesn't count. Um, but Insigne is much more entrenched in the Italian national team than Jovinko ever was. Um, he's been just a bang on starter. He started six of their seven games at the Euro. He started that Nations League semifinal against Spain, started all their big qualifiers. It sounds like he's going to be staying at, with Napoli through the end of the season, which means he'll still be a Serie A player come March when they play those playoff matches against North Macedonia. And if they win, presumably Portugal. Uh, and so it would only be in the summer that he would move to MLS. And I can't believe, you know, the World Cup is in the fall. I can't believe Roberto Mancini would hold that against them. I'd be shocked. So I don't, I don't think in the short term he's in any danger of losing his spot in the Italian national team over this move in terms of the 2022 World Cup. Now, beyond that, maybe. I don't know how Mancini views MLS, if it's along similar lines as Antonio Conti and Ventura did, but uh, we'll see. But at least, uh, you know, there's some people who said, wow, he's really risking his his place in the squad for this World Cup if they make it. Uh, that I don't buy at all. I no. think that I don't, I don't care how little regard Mancini has for the for and MLS. those conversations, they would have been had. And everybody has an understanding as yeah. to what they're going to say and ultimately what they are going to do. And look, from an MLS perspective, the possibility of having a star and starter for the Azuri come uh, November and December, if if it all happens, who knows? <laughs> who, who knows? I mean, that's certainly a feather in uh, in in the cap. And I, yeah, I don't think, I don't, while there is still a, a an attitude and a looking down the nose of some out there, I think that that has changed a tremendous amount over the years. Yeah, I'll, I'll say this, and this is taking it out of Insigne and Jovenko and just looking at it in a larger context. The last barrier that MLS does need to cross is, it'd be interesting if someday we'll see players who are in, ML, are in MLS called up to these top national teams based exclusively on their MLS form. Right. Because up to now, I hate to phrase it like this, but when you see players in MLS called up for these top national teams, it does feel like it's in, in spite of them being in MLS. They, 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 they had some currency before arriving and the national team managers in those countries are, are willing to not hold it against them that they're in MLS, whether that's a Kaka or David Beckham or David Villa. You know, it's like the example would be if like, I mean, this is, I don't think this is going to happen, but if like Brazil called up João Paulo or somebody, because, right. you know, that would be a guy who wasn't in a national team picture before comes to MLS does well. Now all of a sudden gets called up. So it'd be based on his MLS form. And, and you want that coach in that, in that pre-camp interview going, ah, did you see the way that player X beat Tejan Yukan when yeah, he was exactly. playing against New England? And it was a, a great game. We were like, you know, referencing how good they were within an MLS context as to why you're bringing them up. Uh, yeah, 100%. We're not, we're not there yet. There is a little bit of that going maybe, but not necessarily from the top teams, uh, top national teams in the world. But, you know, that'll, that'll happen with time. And that's, that's not only changing 
the reality of the quality on the field, but I think it's also changing the perception of that quality that is that is already on the field. All right, uh, all right, Mossy, we we spent a lot of time talking on on this, but there's some other transfer news here that we uh, that we should hit. Where do you want to go why, next? Why don't we do Why don't we do Trundolo? Because you just mentioned Bob Bradley. Oh, yeah. So okay. Bob Bradley's uh, former team made news today by replacing uh, Bradley with their next manager, and it is Steve Trundolo. No surprise. I know you had some thoughts on Twitter about this move. Yeah, so you know, Steve Terundolo is a you know an American legend, soccer playing legend when it comes to what he did with the national team and the incredible career that he had over uh, over in Germany. And then he parlayed that into opportunities from a coaching perspective, albeit uh, assistant coaching for a number of years uh, and then coaching some youth teams. Uh, and got some really good experience over there, the mayor of Hanover and all that, all that kind of stuff. So his, his experience and his road that he has traveled without a doubt has, I, I think, given him some real unique type of perspective on the game. Came back to the United States, uh, coached uh, in Las Vegas as the farm team, if you will, of, uh, of LAFC. Um it was not good. It was horrible, as a matter of fact, over there in terms of the results that he got. But there was always this this idea that he was there waiting in the wings to then graduate up to uh, LAFC. And now Bob Bradley leaves. Um, I, I don't doubt that John Thorrington uh, and company over there looked around and had some different options out there. But this was this was planned and ultimately executed. And I, I like teams that have plans. They don't have, I don't have to agree with the plans and they may be flawed in my mind, or they may actually be flawed, but I'd rather somebody have a plan than no plan at all. And, you know, succession planning, all that, all that kind of stuff I, I think is important. What I think is interesting about this is that look, and I've said it before, life isn't fair and soccer isn't fair. It's not a meritocracy. When you look at how young Steve Terundolo is, but more importantly, how inexperienced and the experience that he does have has not been very successful when it comes to being uh, a head coach. And now you are giving him a absolutely plum job. There are so many coaches out there that would love nothing more than to coach LAFC, especially in this year coming off a down year where you can just take them back up and be viewed as the, uh, as the savior. Now you got big shoes to fill when it comes to uh, Bob Bradley, but that had run its course, and now you now you make a change. I'm not sure they were necessarily ready to do this at this point, but it got to what are we at June third right now, and they hadn't had a a, a coach yet, and we know that the league uh, MLS is starting even earlier this year, so they kind of they had to do something, and he was sitting there, and so maybe it's an accelerated program, uh, and once again, I, I bet you the uh, that the 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 coaching community out there, a lot of them are grumbling and shaking their heads or scratching their heads when it comes to uh, this hire. But look, you, you use the advantages that you have. Find someone that looks at you in the way that LAFC looks at Steve Terundolo. All right. Even Jesse Marsh, for that matter, he found a way to find different opportunities and different back doors. And I'm not saying that either one of them haven't worked or either one. Jesse's already been very successful. Um, and I, and I don't know if uh, Steve Terundolo is going to be successful, but you know, all of this talk about, about change and about privilege and about uh, you know the uh, systemic things that happen uh, happen out there and then it's you know Steve Terundolo who for a lot of people would look and say well what has he done to merit this not just opportunity but this plum opportunity now I do think he is very different as we said than uh, than Bob Bradley just in terms of the experience or the lack of experience when you're when it comes to him and I'll 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 leave it here. LAFC to me, all right, came in with all guns blazing as an elite super club in Major League Soccer in the things that they did and in the way that they did those things. This does not smell like that. Okay. This isn't um this isn't Nagelsman. Okay. This isn't this isn't like a um a uh, what what do you call um what do you call really uh young that talent that uh that oh gosh what, what's the word i'm looking for um like wonderkin like... yes exactly this isn't this isn't one of those situations okay and yet he has been given been given this opportunity and i hope he makes the best of it and i hope he does i hope he does well all right but this is in my mind a very very big club and this does not smell or smack of 
a big club type of move. What do you think, Mossy? It's interesting. You know, there are certain guys that we all assume will become good managers based on their personality, based on the kind of players they were, and also the experience they've accrued as assistants and being part of some good organizations. But you never know until you're in the chair. You know, there's a Brazilian guy, Silvino, who is very similar to Torunlo in terms of his playing career and, and his experience as an assistant. And everybody assumed he'd be a good manager and the jury is, is way out on him. So we'll see that you're right. He's inheriting a you know, as you like to call it, a super club that, that's so far operated under the highest of expectations. And he's going to be sort of learning on the job here. Uh, so it's going to be fascinating. I, I wouldn't say it's a given that he's going to succeed, but, you know, I, I hope he does because I think we all like him and think he's a you know really good guy. Yeah. And, you know, he will be learning on the job. And when I think of super clubs, I never think of coaches learning on the job. I mean, we've seen, you know, we saw what happened with, with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and, and, and that kind of stuff. I don't know. All right. All right. Uh, or Pirlo. I mean, geez. I mean, there's, there's a perfect example. So it's, it's littered with these guys <laughs> that have been given opportunities simply. And not, and I'm not saying that Steve Trundle is necessarily because he has, he has done work. He has in a certain way more so than others uh, earned it, but just because you were good and in some cases great, as a player does not necessarily mean that you can just come in right away and make that transition. Somebody asked me on Twitter because, you know, Steve Trendle, I have no doubt is still incredibly fit and can still probably play the game. Asked me, said, you know, well, maybe he can get into the games and he can garner respect from the players by playing in five V twos and playing in, in small sided games and stuff like that. I said, well, you know, if Steve Terundolo, I think he's been around the game long enough to know that that is the kiss of death and that is the worst thing that he could possibly do because I think it only uh, creates a a level of of disrespect and even apathy that is really, really detrimental when a coach comes in and doesn't delineate and, and, and separate his or herself from the actual players. And so I don't think that Steve Terundolo is going to do that, but he's going to have his hands full because – Knives out, my friend, both both in terms of all the people around, like I said, when it comes to the, the coaches that are that are grumbling about it. Uh, and I think in the fan, the fan base, I think the fan base is it's going to be a, uh, a a an arms crossed type of situation saying, OK, you are this wonderkin. Then let's see why they have put so much faith in you and why they brought you over and installed you in Las Vegas to get ready for this move. And, uh, you know, we'll see if he lives up to it. I mean, given. The, the on-field record that he has uh, and the personality and character that he has had as a player, uh, hopefully that that serves him well. But we all know that at times it can be very, very different experiences and very, very different uh, different worlds. So good luck to Steve Trundle and congratulations uh, to Steve Trundle, the new coach of LAFC. All right, what else, Masi? Well, hopping back into the transfer world and expanding out of MLS into the, the into Europe, um, so obviously we're off and running here in the January transfer window. Um, Erlen Holland, uh, I still think it's probably going to be in the summer, but you're actually seeing some rumblings about the possibility of him moving this month. The reason would be that he has a buyout clause. So Dortmund would only get 75 million euros in the summer. So if a team offers them more this month, they've been knocked out of the uh, champions league already. They got knocked out in the group stage. And they're in that sort of no man's land in the Bundesliga where they're not going to catch Bayern, but they're probably going to finish in the top four uh, with or without Holland. They've got a big enough gap between themselves and fifth. And so, you know, I, I, if they got offered enough money, I think there is a school of thought that, yeah, I mean, why not? Um, but I mean, the plan still likely seems to be in the summer, but, but, you know, I'm, maybe I'm getting snookered here by the Spanish media, but I, it's starting to feel to me like it's definitely going to be Real Madrid. And I said this a couple of weeks ago when we did our last podcast, I'll reiterate, I think that's a mistake. Um, and, and even Marca, which stands to gain by Real Madrid signing another big name and in terms of the back pages and all that, they posted an article this morning, which was like, how the heck would this work with Holland, Benzema, yeah. uh, Mbappe, Vinicius? And they played around with all these different formations. But the 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 conclusion of the article is pretty much like, no, if you're if you're if the idea is still to be able to play a proper, balanced, functional team, there's no way that this could work. So I don't understand it for a kid who everything he's done up to this point has been so well thought out. Now it just seems like, oh, I got to go to the biggest club possible and the allure of Real Madrid and all that. So 
Um, I would actually be a tad disappointed if that's the way this goes, but it sounds like, I don't know, I'm getting the sense reading the tea leaves that, that it's going to be Real Madrid for sure. Well, I, I'm here for it. I, I mean, you mentioned Benzema, who, you know, oftentimes is <laughs> is, is an unfortunate afterthought, despite how good he is. And he seems to just kind of weather all the storms. And then when all, when all settles, he's there doing exactly what he has done year after year. But at some point, I don't know, maybe they say, all right, we, we're, we're moving on. And so maybe there's a cascading type of effect here. Um, what, what would your, if all of those players are there, let's just say they do it, which, which I'm here for. And by the way, not only would it be great for Real Madrid, but I think it would be an injection that La Liga kind of needs from a business perspective. But let's say that they did it. Let's say they had all of them. I, I, you know, I mentioned there's possibly maybe they get rid of some as part of the whole plan and scheme, but let's just say they had all of them there. Who would you start? Well, I mean, you're saying if you, if you're going to jam all four into the same lineup, well, I mean, I'm not saying you have to have to start them all, but they're all there available. I mean, do you start if you sign Erlen Holland, do you start him over Benzema? I, I don't know how you could do that. I mean, why? I, I think Why can't at you that, do that point, I, I think at that point, Holland would have to be. <laughs> I think amazingly enough, he's inheriting that Luka Jovic role of like Benzema's uh, stand in whenever Benzema misses a game, which is he's so ridiculously overqualified for that role. It's pro- almost preposterous, but. I mean, I don't, I don't know how you're going to bench Kareem Benzema to, to, to for Ellen well, Holland. I don't well, know. Well, you, you're benching him in that you're putting him on the bench, but not for anything he did other than not being as good as Holland. I mean, do you, I mean, you're you're starting Benzema because you think he's better. Yeah, I think right okay. now he's the better all around player. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and settled there, comfortable playing for Real yeah, Madrid yeah, yeah. with Holland. There's you know that unknown of going to a new team, but. Um, okay. So, yeah, I mean, so, so that's the story with Real Madrid, Barcelona are, are just so baffling to me. What's going on at that club. They, 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 they still want to sort of flex their muscles and show that they, they still are Barcelona and they're still a factor in the transfer market. So they're out there being linked with players, making moves. They acquire Ferran Torres from Manchester city for 55 million euros, but as things stand, they can't register him because they're above that La Liga salary limit, the financial fair play stuff. And so they're having a scramble to make moves <laughs> this this month to unload uh, players and, and reduce their, their salary, uh, their wage bill to be able to register Ferran Torres. And so that connects to this Usman Dembele story, which, um, I mean, it, you have to stand in awe sometimes of the hypocrisy of the Spanish media. Uh, and I, I'm going to focus on Barcelona today, but you could just you could say the same thing about Real Madrid. It doesn't matter how players arrive at those clubs. It's just how they leave. Uh, so, you know, Dembele went on strike at Dortmund, refused to train, even though he was under contract, to force a move to Barcelona. And that was fine. That was actually enhanced his reputation because it showed his ambition and he appreciates what an honor it is to play for Barcelona so much that he was willing to force this move. Coutinho fakes an injury, refuses to play for Liverpool to get to Barcelona. And that's great, too. That shows the, how ambitious he is. But then, you know, Neymar signs a contract with Barcelona that contains a buyout clause. Uh, PSG pays the buyout clause. He decides to leave, which you can agree or disagree with the decision. There's nothing unprofessional about that. There's nothing unethical. And he's treated like the worst human being ever. And, And then Dembele this month. So what's happening here is, his contract runs out in the summer. They've offered him a new contract, but it, it's at a pay cut because again, they have to lower their wage bill to be able to register Ferran Torres. And meanwhile, Dembele still has this cachet and this market value where there are other clubs around Europe that are objectively better than Barcelona right now that are offering him more money. And so he's balking at signing Barcelona's deal and is considering just playing out his contract and going somewhere else. And man, you should read the Barcelona media. He's been treated like the worst human being ever for doing this, this spoiled ingrate. And I, I thought I was reading like a Kirk Herbstreet column. I mean, the way the things they're saying about him. <laughs> and, and so it, it, you just, I mean, it's amazing to me. It, it just scratch your head sometimes. I mean, like, do, do you, I mean, th- this hypocrisy that these clubs have, that it's, you know, it's okay for players to behave unprofessionally to get to those clubs, but then on the way out the door, if they choose to leave, it doesn't even have to be that they do anything unprofessional, but just the mere fact that they choose to leave somehow makes them horrible people no, nothing surprises me for any club <laughs> uh, for, in that, for that matter but certainly nothing surprises me in the present day situation that barcelona is i mean they're like you know we're out here in hollywood so you have some of these hollywood stars that you know they go through a period of of incredible wealth and fame right and then for a lot of them it it goes away that the you know the the movie roles dry up the the uh the series that they're on finishes whatever it ends up being and yet they feel they have to continue to live 
this lifestyle in terms of the, the things that they do, the things that they say, the things they wear, the things they drive, all that kind of stuff. And so they end up doing it simply for the effect to, and it's not even for everybody else. Honestly, a lot of times it's for themselves to make themselves feel or continue to feel worthy. Uh, and they equate it with, you know, the, you know, these audacious types of things uh, that they do that we all know they can't necessarily afford. I mean, they've just spent the last year telling us what dire straits they are in and how many problems that they, that they have. And yet not only are they, are they spending money here, but, but then you see some of the quotes coming out where they're doubling down saying we're back baby. And we're <laughs> big and we're, we're, you know, we're big and bold and sexy. And you're, you're saying, yeah, but you, you, you're, you're leasing that car. You're renting that that uh, that house in the uh, in the hills. <laughs> so. and, and, and you know the, the funny thing about the Dembele situation. Look, I, I think Dembele gets sometimes unfairly tossed in the same basket as Coutinho and Griezmann. Those are guys that it never felt right with Barcelona. They never played like stars. Dembele, the issue has been injuries. When he's been fit, he's had some really great moments there where he's looked like a superstar. Uh, which is why he still has value elsewhere because there's still this tantalizing talent. Uh, but it's just so clear to me that it's not going to happen at Barcelona. It's not meant to be. And yet he's a player that they could sell and get some decent money, which would alleviate some of their financial situation. And, and so he would seem like a prime candidate, a guy that it, selling him is not weakening their team that much because he's barely played the season because he's been injured. And yet he could bring back a decent amount of money and is like a fairly big salary they'd be getting off the books. So it makes perfect sense to me. And yet they seem intent on re-signing him and yet are offering him a pay cut. So the, the whole thing is so contradictory on so many levels. Their, their president, Laporta, came out the other day and said, he's better than Mbappe. And, and well, if he's better than Mbappe, why are his salary demands so outrageous then? Because what he's asking for, the Barcelona media thinks is, is crazy. Well, wait a minute, you've just told the guy that he's better than Mbappe. So, the, I mean, it's the whole thing is just handled so poorly. Everything that club does now is a head scratcher. And, you know, I mentioned how they're, scrambling to sell player Sergino Dest has gotten sort of caught up yep. in this year his name floating around in transfer rumors and by the way a guy whose value everywhere else is still very high because the, the, the teams you hear are like Chelsea Bayern Munich teams that are much better than Bayern Munich and are willing to fork over pretty good money to sign him so it, it's sort of a funny situation where he's supposedly not good enough for this Barcelona team but Bayern and Chelsea want to sign him so so make sense out of that oh man you know it's like uh you know <laughs> a, a, a uh um an old money type of family that's on that's hit bad times and financial crisis and they're having an estate sale and all the whispers and the shame of having to sell the heirlooms and the, and the things that they have, you know, I mean, do what you need to do to be solvent, to be, to be smart in the 2022 world in which we live in. You can't, you can't live in the past, which is what Barcelona is trying, uh, is trying to do. You need somebody to come in and make those hard decisions that are going to enable you to even have a chance of becoming what you once were in the future. But I don't know. And, anyway. and you know, I mean, some look, of the other, fun from the outside. Yeah, I mean, some of the other big names to look at this month, you have these disgruntled strikers like Ab Abamayang, um, Morata, uh, Anthony Martial, Mauro Icardi. So I expect <laughs> some of those guys to be on the move. Lukaku. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that in the next segment. And then, you know, one last thing I do want to bring up that I'm fascinated to see what happens is this young Argentine, Julian Alvarez, who actually was just named uh, South American Player of the Year. Uh, I, Tim Vickery is super high on this guy. He thinks he's the best thing to come out of Argentina in years. And it's kind of interesting. I've talked about how you can trace the decline of South American club football by looking at the winners of this South American Player of the Year award, because my God, when this award started in the 70s and 80s, it was every year it was Tostón, Pelé, Maradona, Zico, Mario Kempes, Teofilo Cubillas, Elias Figueroa, Socrates, Francesco. It was one legend after another. And, and, and even as you got into the 90s and 2000s, when South Americans started to flock to Europe, you'd still catch these young guys in the early part of their careers. Riquelme won this. Tevez won it three years in a row when he was a youngster. Boca Neymar won it a couple of years in a row when he was coming up at Santos. But then last seven or eight years, it's been this string of journeyman guys winning it that you look at and you say, boy, if that's the best player in South American club football, you kind of tells you something. I will say Julian Alvarez is kind of a, a throwback to more of a Tevez Neymar type winner because He's a really exciting talent that all the big clubs in Europe are interested in. But uh, Marcelo Gallardo uh, surprisingly signed a one-year extension with River. He's going to coach them in 2022. And 
this traces back to our uh, Pepe and, and DK conversation. There's a sentiment in Argentina that, hey, on it's a World Cup year. Just play it safe. Stay with River another year and then move after the World Cup. Uh, he, he actually has a potential to be an important player in that Argentina World Cup squad. And, and they're afraid of him moving to Europe at a young age, going to some club where he doesn't play and it, it stalls his momentum. So that's another young player to keep an eye on uh, either this month or in the summer. Julian Alvarez, keep an eye on him. Very talented young Argentinian player for River Plate. All right. Well, we've spent a long time talking uh, this segment. Let's uh, let's take a real quick break. And when we come back, we'll take a, another quick uh, lap around all the stuff that was happening over in Europe on the field. Don't go away. All right. We're back. And, uh, you know, as I said in the uh, in the open, much of my um, my days were spent, you know, in the Florida sun, also watching just the incredible amount of soccer that, uh, that was on. And a lot of it obviously is uh, what happened over in England because they've done a really, really good job strategically of identifying the holiday season and playing game after game after game. Now, some of it was curtailed uh, this season because of COVID uh, for obvious reasons. And so there wasn't even this, the same amount. And yet every morning and afternoon, there was games to be had and some, some really, really good games and fun games. Before we get into that, Mossy, the it seems like it's kind of an evergreen thing, but it's, it seems more amplified this year. The the whining coming from <laughs> people in the EPL about the amount of games and the amount of stress and the wear and, and tear. Look, this is this is part of the tradition and the history and the ritual of this country and culture that either you are a part of and you understand as a coach or as a player, or you are a guest in as a coach and, uh, and as a player, uh, as I've said before, and I'll say it again, as a player, all I wanted to do was play games. I did not want to train. I could have had a game every other day. I would have been fine with that. Now it's a little easier when you're a center back. I, uh, I get it, but everybody's going through the same thing. And if everybody is going through the same thing, then it's all relative. And so having big time coaches who already have an advantage because of the amount of money and because of their roster size and the talent and the quality that they, uh, that they have complaining and whining and, and screaming, uh, screaming about it. It's, it, it's a bit rich. This is what's paying you. This is what has paid. This is what has helped make not only it, uh, the most popular league in the world, but one of the most entertaining leagues in the world. And specifically because of this period. And when you talk to and, and, uh, and hear fans and supporters talk about it, they love this Christmas and this, uh, this holiday period that comes. I love it. I think it was inspired and brilliant to, to have this on a consistent basis where you basically, not that they don't own the, the world as it is, but you own it even more in this period. So I, I love it. And look, I think, I think when it comes to the players, they recognize that this is part of the existence and this is part of, I guess, if you want to call it, want it a cost, this is part of the cost of playing in the EPL. And it ended up giving us some great games. Okay. And I, I was, I was struck by the fact that all of this whining and complaining and what they call it, whinging or whatever uh, from uh, these coaches, there was, there was great soccer. Of course there was some bad soccer too, but that happens you know, no matter what, but Whatever problems that they were having, and whether it's fatigue or whether it's COVID or any other type of thing or being hung over or whatever it ends up being, the players adapt and they found a way to provide the type of entertainment in some, not just good games, but some great games and some great action out there. All right, that's my preface to, to what happened. What do you want to get into first here, Mossy? So there were... Two games involving the top four teams in the table. Let's take them in chronological order. New Year's Day. Arsenal hosted Manchester City. Uh, and listen, here's what I'll say about this game. Manchester City are allowed to have one game like this a season. I mean, my God, they're usually pretty good value for, for 99% of their wins. If anything, a lot of the points they drop come in games that they dominated. So they, they can have one kind of lucky smash and grab type win. Uh, but And that's what this was because they were they were not at their best. They did not play well at all in this game. Uh, when it was 11 V 11, Arsenal was clearly the better team. They should have been up by a couple of goals. Uh, and Arsenal were undone by, you know, two minutes of madness in which 
I didn't love the penalty um, because I agree with Robbie Musto. I think Bernardo Silva threw himself on the ground, was already going down when the shirt tug occurred. But I don't think it's a travesty because there was that shirt tug. So he did give the referee a, 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 an excuse there to make that call. Uh, and then, you know, the Gabriel, that decision begets the Gabriel red card because Gabriel picked up a yellow complaining about the penalty. And you could tell was still uh, incensed about that decision when he committed the second foul on Gabriel Jesus and, and got his second yellow. And, and amazingly enough, Arsenal still defended well with 10 men and, and City. Again, it just speaks to what an off day it was for them. They couldn't really create anything with a man advantage and ended up scoring their winner in stoppage time, uh, an uncharacteristic scrappy goal from the unlikeliest of sources in Rodri. <laughs> and so uh, so really uh, a, a just smash the way, and grab just win the way Pep drew it up. Hold on. I want to yeah. make sure I understand. Do you uh, think so? Hold on. Hold on. I want to make sure I understand ahead, yeah, what yeah, you're saying. Ahead, I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Are you saying that? I mean, and look, Pep after the game said we we did not play well. Okay. But as was during the game and after the game, many, many people said, and rightfully so, that's what champions do, even in a day where it wasn't there. And it is rarely not there for this team. It's <laughs> it's arguably the greatest team in the world. It wasn't there, and yet they still managed to figure it out, okay? Not because of any great tactics or any great coach or anything like that. The ball bounced here. They got, a, they got their opportunity. But I want to make sure, were, were, were you, did, you, did you look at this as a travesty? Not a travesty, but did you look at, from an Arsenal perspective, that they were beaten by just the soccer gods and fate? Or was it a referee type of situation and a VAR type of situation? Because a lot of people feel like that – that this was, yes, they missed their opportunities that they had, but ultimately the, the, you know, the biggest point was that, uh, that VAR didn't do its job. The referees didn't do their job. Yeah. Like I said, I didn't love that penalty decision and that was the biggest call in the game. So yeah, I, I guess I am saying that refereeing, uh, really contributed to their defeat. Yeah. I mean, I, I know we love to talk about champions digging down deep and, yeah. and, and, and all that. I don't think that's what this was. I think Pep would even admit this was just, they were fortunate. Uh, they didn't play well. They didn't deserve to get anything out of this game and just the bounces went their way. Um, and, and yeah, you know, for Arsenal, it's funny because they, the fans gave the players a standing ovation coming off the field and it's easy to roll your eyes at that. And I, I'm not big on moral victories, but I do think in this case, that even in defeat, they sort of enhance their reputation because they've been they've come off a string of good results here, but it's come against weaker teams. And and this performance, I think, did validate that some of the good things they've been doing are real. And what do you mean? They got a red card and they had to play a man down. What, how was that good? But but I'm saying the way they played 11 versus 11 against Manchester City, I think validates that some of the improvement they've shown in recent games was real. It wasn't just, oh, they're playing easier opponents. Okay. And then when they went up against Manchester City, they got exposed. I think you do see that this is a team that's heading in the right direction. There, there's there's lots to like here. Uh, and like I said, they just were undone by two minutes of madness there, made some mental mistakes. But I think, yeah, I, I can see why an Arsenal fan would take definitely some positives out of this game, I guess is what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what Arsenal is at this point. <laughs> they're taking, you know, just moral victories of actually playing well and putting up a good fight, the little engine that could against uh, the big, bad meanies uh, of, uh, of Manchester City. Uh, all right, what else? So uh, so City win that game. So you move ahead to the following day. And, you know, look, we all thought this, you know, Chelsea hosting Liverpool. And if you want a title race, the one thing you couldn't have here is a draw. You, you want somebody to win this game and establish the fact that they're going to be City's chief pursuers. And instead, what do we get? We get a 2-2 draw. Um, really, uh, it was it wasn't that well played of a game. It was it was actually pretty ragged for yeah. two teams of that caliber, but it was it was certainly exciting. Um, and Liverpool jump out to a, a two 0 lead uh, at Stamford Bridge. That second goal, man. I mean, there were I say it wasn't well played, but there were some moments of genius. That second goal, that ball from Alexander Arnold, and then the the way Salah brought it down, the shimmy past Alonso, and then just chipping it past Mendy. I mean, that was, was a genius He's... goal. And but then uh, Chelsea get back into it with the incredible strike by Kovacic, and then uh, I don't what nationality is he in the the kid that scored the second Chelsea goal. He is just a great player who happens to be American. Okay, he's not an Amer he's not an American great player. He's just a great player that happens to be American. Yeah, Pulisic. But before before we get to that, should we start with the Lukaku thing? Oh yeah, because you know that that was a big story heading into yeah. the game. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So so Romelu Lukaku, uh, striker. Uh, evidently, he did an interview a few weeks ago and they put it in the yeah. can and, and as the, uh, in Italian, uh, and as the presses want to do, uh, they strategically 
re released it. Now, um, you know, we've talked a lot over the last couple of weeks about lost in translation and meaning and nuance and all that kind of stuff. But um, and I'm going to read some of the quotes here. Physically, I am fine, but I am not happy with the situation at Chelsea. Tuchel has chosen to play with another system. I am not happy with the situation, but I am professional and I can't give up now. Uh, needless to say, those comments did not go down well <laughs> um, externally or, or probably internally. I, I, and so the, so the question leading up to this was, were there going to be ramifications from a player in the press basically saying he is unhappy, but also kind of, you know, blaming and calling out the head coach and what that does to the, the dynamic between him and that coach, but also within the locker room and, and locker room dynamics are a fascinating and constantly changing and evolving type of organism that, that are, that are different at different times. But the question then is from a tactical perspective and just a, a practical perspective is here is this great number nine for a team that doesn't have a number nine, a true number nine, so much so that they've been playing false, false nines and players kind of out of position, including Christian Pulisic at times up there. Do you do anything? Do you punish him? Do you sit him out? Well, we come to find out that, that Tuchel decided before the game that it was enough of a problem that not only did he not start him, he did not uh, dress him. He was he was not there. So that's how he decided to deal with the situation. And it's probably a fascinating look into the the psyche and the strategy um, and the mentality of coaches that have to manage players and some very very big egos. And so the question coming on air was. Is this the right thing to do? Would you do this or wouldn't you do this? And I think it was pretty much divided. You know, you, you mentioned, you know, some of the NBC folks and the, and the guys that we were watching there. Uh, there were different types of ideas with, with the recognition that we don't necessarily know everything that was said or everything that is going on behind the scenes or even other stuff that has nothing to do with this uh, interview relative uh, to Lukaku. My point is that Tuchel or any other coach, okay, Yes, there are hills you want to die on, all right? Yes, there are times that you want to make a point. I'm not sure that I would have, and this is again from the outside, that this is that moment that I would have chosen uh, to do that. You got to have a pretty thick skin. And Tuchel, even after the game, said, I didn't take it personally or anything. Well, obviously, he he took it personally, not necessarily in himself, but he, he took it personally, I guess, for Chelsea, so much so that he thought, it couldn't be overcome, and he had to make this decision. And in doing that decision, I think he did a disservice to his team and did not necessarily do his job. And I'm sure if he were here, he would say, no, you don't understand. There's a bigger picture. There's a long-term type of thing. I can't have this. There's stuff going on inside. All, all, that, all that is fine and well, but you, you, have to be, you have to be able to look at things, I think, and make decisions because this is this is not under ten. This is not AYSO. All right, this is this is the professional game. And yes, there are, are dynamics. And yes, at times the players act like they are children in AYSO. But ultimately, you do your job, and your job is to put the best possible players on the field to get a result for your team. And in that moment, because of this, I don't think he did it. I actually don't care about the the, the interview. I would if I was a coach. I would encourage my players, say whatever the hell you want. I don't, it really doesn't matter. All right. Say crazy stuff, uh, you know, whatever, let the chips fall where they may. If you have a problem, you can come talk to me and we can deal with it uh, like that. But if I read something in different languages or whatever, I mean, it's so hard to understand what people are thinking and, and nuance and stuff like that. I mean, unless you say this guy's an ass. I mean, there's no real different ways and different ways of thinking about uh, thinking about that. But even if that happened, I'd probably laugh. And then I would have I would have put it back on him. I would have put the onus on him and said, listen, you did this and you said this. All right. And there's people that are angry out there. All right. You need to now go prove that you're not an ass because there's a lot of people that are looking at you after what you said and think that you are and think that you don't care. All right. And now I'm going to put you out there in the uh, in the spotlight and you better perform. And so, I mean, and use it in different ways and, and use different ways to motivate. And look, maybe what Tuchel did is the absolute right thing for the long term remains to be seen. But 
I don't think that Chelsea was at its best because they didn't have one of their best players there simply because of something that he said in the paper. And the latest is there's supposedly having a meeting today. And Tuchel said, based on this meeting, he's going to determine whether Lukaku will play in the uh, midweek league cup semifinal against Tottenham. So, uh, but, but Tuchel was pretty conciliatory after a game said, no, there's absolutely a way back for him and, and we can work this out. So th- the only part of it, you know, the context here is he left Inter in controversial circumstances in the summer and felt like he never got a chance to explain himself. And so this was an interview on Sky Italia, which was, for the precise reason of him giving his side of the story of his inter departure. And so all the stuff about, I love inter, I miss inter. I want to come back someday. I don't mind any of that. Um, the, the, you know, saying that, that Tuco is playing the wrong formation or, or I don't like the formation he's playing. That's where that's something that needs to be sorted because I mean, I, I assume Tuco is going to keep playing the same formation that he thinks is the best for his team. So they're going to have to come to some sort of understanding on that. I, I mean, don't you think that's something that that is potentially problematic if a coach, if a player is publicly saying we're playing with not the right formation, you know, under I this mean, coach? But players don't like formations. They don't like the, the style that they're playing. Okay, that's fine. I mean, I would, if this is the first time that Tuchel is either hearing about it or senses it, then I don't think that he has his finger on the pulse then of what's going on. And, and if it is, then okay, fair, uh, fair play. All right. We don't, we don't know. Oh, go ahead. No, no. If you want to transition back to the game. Well, yeah. I mean, because, you know, I don't, once again, I don't want to bury the American lead there, but I just, I mean, it was a huge part of the story going in, but what it ultimately did was create an opportunity and create an opportunity for somebody to step up and somebody to star. And, you know, coming into this game, uh, you know, we all get excited from an American perspective when American is playing and certainly when Christian Pulisic is, is playing for Chelsea. And that's not all the time we've seen him play actually a number of different positions uh, of late and kind of fill in whether that's good or bad, you know, it r- remains to be seen. But ultimately, Christian Pulisic is an attacking player. And so a lot of times we will judge attacking players on the goals that they're getting, the opportunities that they're creating and doing all that kind of stuff. So. You know, that's how this game set up. Christian Pulisic is once again starting, but he's not starting is that false nine. He's starting in a much more traditional outside wide type of position. Immediately, Christian Pulisic is involved in the game. Um, he has an opportunity early on that he gets stuffed by the goalkeeper and immediately the, you know, the, the great divide that is out, out there of whether Christian Pulisic is good or it's not even good and okay, it's good or bad basically. And never the twins shall meet. Um, it goes into overdrive, whether it's on social media or in the stadium, uh, he start he starts hearing and you think, oh, here, you know, here we go. And ultimately he comes good and he scores not just a goal, but just a, a beautiful, beautiful goal to get that second goal, to secure that point, to break that drought and probably to take off some pressure. And you could kind of feel that this was, this was a moment that he savored because of the pressure that uh, that he was under. And it once again, through this evergreen debate that people are having about whether Christian Pulisic is really good for Chelsea uh, or not, uh, it, it threw another wrinkle into it. And, you know, ultimately, I think he came out of it, you know, certainly smelling better, whether he's smelling like a rose uh, or not, who who knows? And this is not a long-term type of situation where you're just going to rely on Christian Pulisic, but he certainly uh, came out of it in a much more positive light than he has been in the past. I still don't think this necessarily changes what Tuchel thinks about Christian Pulisic, um, but it, it doesn't hurt. Yeah, Pulisic either had an awful game or a great game, depending on which Max Bredos tweet you saw. Um, but no, I mean, in defense of Max, he Pulisic did start off poorly, and it's amazing what a difference that goal made to his confidence because after that, the second half, he was one of the best players in the field. Um, and, you know, he did finish the game at wing back, which I know some people didn't like, but, uh, you know, that's uh, Tuchel taking advantage of what he thinks is his versatility. Um, and so... Yeah, no, it was it was nice to see. It was definitely a definitely a, a positive step in the right direction for him. Uh, you know, I was going to say that there was I, I watched this game on the flight back to LA. That the that I was on JetBlue and they get USA, so it was perfect. And it was one funny moment. Do you remember that play in the second half in which Salah was through on goal and he tried a, a curling shot from distance and Mendy made an incredible save yep. backpedaling. 
uh, I, I, I like yet let out a scream in that moment and everybody in the, in the airplane turned around. I was like, what the hell's wrong with this? Uh, it was, uh, I love it. but, but to your point, it was a great game. It was a really entertaining game. I'm not sure. I mean, from a, if you want to get all wonky about it and you know, the, 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 the way that it was played, I'm not, probably people aren't going to like it, but for pure entertainment value, it was one of those games that you just wanted, you wanted to, to continue. Uh, let me ask you, uh, did you think that it was a red card in the first, I don't know if you were watching it from the beginning, but did you think yeah, it was yeah, a red card Mane in the first play. I was with, gonna uh, say that. with Mane? <laughs> you don't expect there to be a flashpoint five seconds into the game, but th- this really was. Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I just think, you know, a referee couldn't wrap his head around sending, sending off a player that early in the game. But I think if that play happens later on in the game, he's he, there's a very good chance it's a red card. I know that shouldn't matter, but I, you know, we've talked about how referees are human beings. <laughs> no, but why, why shouldn't that matter? People are, people are losing their minds that that <laughs> should matter uh, or, or that, that, that even matters. Like how, if you, have you never watched the game? Do you not understand that there are, there are nuances, there are gray areas, there are different interpretations of this. I mean, look, ultimately, these are all subjective types of things. I'm not talking about objective things where either it's over the line or not over the line, right? These are human beings that are making subjective type of decisions uh, when, when it comes to it. And I, all of these things that, that were held up as a failure of either the VAR or of just the pure referees out there. And now we've talked about, you know, time and time again, we, I've heard, well, they're not players and you should have all players. By the way, the quickest way to have, let it, let's let the uh, game go to hell in a handbasket is to have former players referee. Okay. Uh, just because they have played doesn't mean that they will have any clue as to how to referee a game or will do it uh, or will do it any better. And you will have just as many controversies and probably even more when it comes to the way that a player would referee a game. It's I'm telling you, it's a whole lot easier from the outside. It's a lot easier from the bar. It's a lot easier from the stands. It's a lot easier from your couch to referee than actually get it. And that doesn't mean that there aren't bad referees. Okay. But just because a referee makes a call and a subjective call that you disagree with does not mean that they are a bad referee. (laughs) Uh, And that there are nuances that a foul can be a foul here and not here, even though it doesn't state it in the laws. Welcome to soccer. Okay. And unless you have never watched the game, because real quickly you recognize that there are that, that calls are made differently in different times. Calls are made differently in different places. And you know what? I want that. I, I want that. I, I, I like that there is some wiggle room for for that to happen. And and look, I know if if all you care about is is Chelsea, then you you want you want him thrown off. All right? But this is once again the most popular league in the world that is being broadcast to the world. And referees don't want to be the, the decisive factor in the game and in that first 15 seconds. Now look, if he took his head off, all right? And it was a, you know, there's blood and there's an injury and it's a real just violent type of thing. Okay, I I, I get it. But this this had that gray area area feel. So I was oh I was okay with that. Anyway, go ahead. Uh no, so I mean, so it ends uh 2-2. And you look at the table now, and the question becomes, is it over? It's over. Um and it's over. I'm sorry, it's over. <laughs> Here's what I would say. Um it is over because of the Africa Cup of Nations. Otherwise, I would give Liverpool a slight chance to still make a run and make this interesting. But there's no way losing Salah and Mane for the period of time they're going to lose them. They're probably going to come out of that trailing by more points than they are now with more games checked off the schedule. And so at that point, I just don't see that there's any way back. And I don't get any sense that Chelsea are going to mount this great second half of the season charge here. So so it is over. And, and I think the Africa Cup of Nations contributes to that, which uh, you know, does lead us into our next topic. Um, so, you know, you mentioned at the top all the chirping that's going on from Premier League managers about the schedule and they had only being three subs instead of five and the COVID and games not being postponed, et cetera. And then one more thing to toss into that basket they're not happy about is losing players to the Africa Cup of Nations. So I know there's been a lot of, lot of conversation about this. I have some thoughts on it, but I'll go to you first. I mean, do you have any sympathy for these managers complaining or no? Uh, they just need to get on with it. 
unless they've never heard of the African Cup of Nations, <laughs> unless they have no idea that this is something that actually happens, which actually wouldn't surprise me with some of the guy, these guys in terms of the way that they talk about. I mean, the lack of respect and the way that it's almost with with just disdain in, in and complete disrespect that this this lowly type of tournament could possibly exist and fuck up my world. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's, it's so irre- Look, I understand that it causes problems, but you know what? Plan for it because you know that this is coming. And if you don't want to sign any African players because of this possibility, then you don't sign any African players and you come out and say, this is why we're not signing any African players because they, and you force them to, to change the dates or do, uh, do whatever. But this is a really important tournament, and you see it from the players that participate in it. You recognize how much pride they take in getting on that plane, again, like we talked about, and going back. And that you don't understand that, or you don't feel it, and worse, that you don't even, at the very least, respect it. I think that's, I think it's, I think it's disgusting. I mean, it, so, all right, yeah, I mean, you're going you're gonna to miss some players. The only thing I'll say is that, you know, it's been framed as if any criticism of, of the situation is elitist or, or in some cases even racist. Mm-hmm. The only thing I'll say is I, anybody that listens to this podcast, I've been pretty consistent over the fact that I think there's too much international football and the calendar is oversaturated. And so I would like them to go to every four years. I know that's it's every two years. There's been this debate. Uh, Infantino came out in 2020 and said it should be every four years. But now he's sort of walked that back a little bit because I think he realizes it, it, it comes off as very self-serving <laughs> while he's trying to push for the World Cup to be every two years and be telling other competitions, hey, every four years is enough. I mean, come on. <laughs> so but, uh, you, you want to inhibit the possibility of talent and stars emerging and using the AFCON platform, which in times uh, in the past we have seen, to show their wares as a platform, as a shop window to the rest of the world. Again, this goes back to my to my point about you, you want to talk about elitism, that type of attitude. But it's not elitism because I it would is. say the same thing about the Euros, the Copa America, the Gold Cup. I, I think international football should exist in four year cycles and all the international tournaments should be every four years. And I think that would allow players to always be performing at their best. And so to, for me, it's more of a calendar sort of fitness issue. Uh, so, you know, people say, oh, would you be saying the same thing about the Euros? Actually, I would. If they change the Euros every two years, I'll be the first one to complain about that. So, you know, to have this situation every other season, I think, is a bit much. You know, if it if it's only an issue that comes around once every four years, I think, you know, it's, it's not that much of a disruption. People would learn to live with it. But I, yeah, I but think it's every but two you're years. Being, you're, you have the ability to enjoy those other tournaments when those things are not being played. And a lot of those players that you are talking about, they don't get that opportunity. So you're... You're looking at it as from your enjoyment of the the games that you are going to that you're going to watch and you get to watch everything because you don't have necessarily a horse in this uh, in in this race in the same way. And I know I'm going to, you know, deviate here for a second, but in the same way that I don't know if you saw we talked about Mbappe a little early, just, you know, and you see his comments regarding the uh, the World Cup every two years. Well, you know, here is here is a a man who's already won a world cup he plays for arguably the best team in the world all right he is rich beyond all uh beyond most people that exist uh in the world and he's saying no we want it every every 4 years why wouldn't why wouldn't he want to give other others more opportunity to experience what he experienced. Why wouldn't he want to give others more opportunity to have those advantages, to change their life, to fundamentally change their life? This is, look, this is a back and forth that we, uh, that we do. And it's, it's, it's not without rebuttal. And I, I get that. But as it, as it, as it pertains to AFCON, um, I don't necessarily see it as racist or, or, or anything. I know that, that that accusation has been thrown around in terms of the way that people kind of look down their noses at it. I just think that you're being disingenuous when you are talking uh, about, and you're being a little bit, you are definitely being disrespectful, incredibly disrespectful to a region of the world that produces so much talent, a lot of talent, by the way, that enables you to do your job. And if you do it, uh, 
and if you do it well, you get more job, and that is going to continue to produce an incredible amount of talent, especially when it comes to the English Premier League uh, out there. And to crap all over something like that, it's just, you know, read the room, dude. Uh, now, you you covered the 2010 World Cup in South Africa, right? I did. Yes, I was what there. Was, what was the, the temperature like there? What, what was it like being? It was incredible. It was, you know, because it was it was for the first time the celebration of a continent that had long been such a huge part of the soccer world. And yet at times was not necessarily to, you know, to what we're talking about here, respected in a way. And, you know, I mean, like, like a lot of the places that we've gone, there was this desire to welcome us and to show the world a different side of something that, either we didn't know a whole lot about or were, you know, misinformed about what was, uh, what was going on. And but I guess so, yeah. my point is, so, you know, there, that's been argued too. There are some places in Africa with the climate to, to hold this in the quote unquote summer months, June, July, the African mm-hmm. Cup of Nations. And so why don't they more, more often than they do put it in those places? Uh, you know, in fact, in 2019, the Africa Cup of Nations was in Egypt and was held during the summer. Now, now the issue there is that it occurred at the same time as the Women's World Cup, which prompted Grant Wall's infamous uh, jump in a lake tweet. So, uh, but uh, well, maybe but so- here. OK, so maybe if there's a World Cup every two years and the member nations uh, of FIFA are given more money, maybe they can increase the infrastructure and we can have stadiums like we see in uh, Qatar that are climate controlled. And you could possibly have that AFCON thing happen more easily in the summer. I'm I'm all for that. I understand. I, I understand that that it happens at this time. I recognize is unique, is different, and poses challenges. But once again, this is not a surprise to anybody. If they found a way to make it work, and everybody was copacetic and said, "This is great. We're going to do it in the summer," like a lot of these tournaments uh, that happen, great, no problem. But you think they would have found a way to be able to do that? So obviously, the challenges are too much either when it comes to logistics or temperature uh, or, you know, who knows, politics or anything like that, uh, that are too much to overcome at this point. But who knows in the future? Um, and, oh, by the way, one last Premier League note before we move on. We're taping this on a Monday. Manchester United lost at home to Wolves today. Uh, you know, I was, <laughs> oh, by I was the big, way, <laughs> I was big on the Ralph Rangnick move. It's early, but so far he hasn't exactly covered himself in glory, but uh, we'll see if. Uh... So is, is this Rangnick out or, uh, or Armis out? What are we, what are we looking at here? Oh, seeing yeah. Chris Armis there on the sideline. Good for, you know, good for him. But this is, I mean, uh, this is, this is a disaster uh, right now. I mean, the, the anger and the angst and again, the consternation coming out from uh, Manchester United right now, after what happened, not just the loss, the way in which they lost um, the, the just complete lack of any resemblance to anything in the past that gave people pride and hope as one of the great teams in the world. Uh, And it's not even a shadow of their former selves. What, what is less than a shadow? Nothing. It's just a, a vanished form of themselves. And so, yeah, it's, it's not going well for uh, the red side of Manchester. Um, and then I, I know you said the Premier League had monopolized everybody's attention, but La Liga did come back this weekend. Uh, Real Madrid suffered a shock 1-0 defeat to Getafe, which does open the door for Sevilla if they can win their games in hand to make this interesting. We'll see. Uh, Atletico beat Rayo Vallecano 2-0, Correa with both goals. And then Barcelona, who were missing a slew of players. Xavi wanted this game postponed, but it was played. They beat uh, Stu Holden's Mallorca 1-0, Luke de Jong with the goal. Barcelona, for all their struggles, are only one point out of fourth. So it's trending towards them finishing in the top four. I think Betis is the team that's in there now that will probably drop out. It'll be Real Madrid, Sevilla, Atletico, and Barcelona in some order. Uh, So if they can salvage a top four finish this season, it it won't be uh, such a uh, disaster. I I will say, looking at the landscape of the the top five leagues in Europe, I mean, Bayern and PSG 100% are going to win their leagues. Um, I still think Real Madrid is 
almost certain to win La Liga. I'm pretty bullish on Inter, to be honest. I think they're clearly the best team in Serie A. They're ahead at the midway point of all the momentum. So I'd say like 75% chance they win it. And you've proclaimed the Premier League over with Manchester City. Right. So we're, uh, we it's might done. not have much. Well, we can, of yeah, we can get ready for MLS. Which, which is by the way, the, the lack of title races leads perfectly into our first Ask Alexi, uh, which. Uh, all right. So we'll, we'll take a real quick break. I will say before we go, go to break here, I was texting with Stu Holden during that Mallorca game game he he was not happy with his goalkeeper and and nor should he be because the flailing from a uh a, a veteran type of goalkeeper uh on the uh on the goal was was not great so don't worry Stu. all right Th- these are not the games that you're necessarily supposed to win so keep your head up kiddo uh all right we're gonna take another quick break and as you mentioned we'll be back with our ask alexi don't go away all right, we're back, and it's time for Ask Alexi. You send in those questions on the old uh, Twitter machine or uh, Instagram or Facebook. And, of course, we have our uh, State of the Union podcast hotline, which is 657-549-2297. That's 657-549-2297. You can call in and in a little bit more leisurely way uh, express yourself, but still try to be efficient. And, you know, hopefully it's something interesting. And like I said, it's done in a, a timely manner, but it's just a different type of way. And we've had some wonderful questions over the year. That hotline has really uh, paid dividends. Uh, we have a bunch of Twitter questions this week, Mossy. What do the people want to know about? Uh, first up, at Joe Herbers asks, what do you think of this study showing the results of European football matches are becoming more predictable? And he linked to this article Um, This study that was done after analyzing 26 years worth of European soccer matches, scientists have determined the games have become more predictable over time and the home field advantage has vanished. They concluded our findings highlight the need for stronger regulations around club incomes, expenditures and player salaries, including more effective caps. What do you make of all that? Well, it sounds like that after all the data and numbers are are crunched, that parity (laughs) produces a situation uh, where where it is less predictable. And uh, you don't need me or anybody else to tell you that. Uh, so yeah, I understand what they are saying. I do think that the, it's not just the analytics that have come into play. It, it's the philosophy. It is the, you know, the, the adherence to possession or patterns and look patterns and, and, and tactics have always been involved. But I think the, positional type of coaching, the um, the adherence to playing a certain way, especially when it comes to playing out of the back, has lent itself to teams being more predictable. And let's be honest, first off, so we should maintain some perspective because I still think that soccer, more so than any game out there, is unpredictable. More so than any game out there is chaos theory. It is it is left up to the gods, despite all of our notions and all of our work and all of our coaching and, and, uh, um, and data and, and different things out there. When it comes right down to it, the human beings on the field uh, decide what happens. And yes, there are predictable type of things that you can, uh, that you can see coming based on data that you have, but, you know, I mean, we, we talked earlier, the goal that um, that Manchester City scored to win the game. I, nobody's teaching that. Nobody's telling me that that is going to happen. All right. Um, and until that actually happens, OK, fine, because you can do that in other sports. You can be much more predictive about what's going on. Having said that, we are at a point right now when it comes uh, to our game and the, the data backs it up. Um, where it is more predictable that they are looking at, like I said, stronger regulations around club incomes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But who, who wants to do that? Because while that might increase parity, it fundamentally changes the power and the structure, if you will, that has been such a tradition and such a part of the culture so much so that, you know, while I talk about super clubs, the reality is that, There are clubs that as many people love as hate, but then there are the little clubs where the romantic notion is equally as strong with those people. So if you want to change it, you can get a situation where it's less predictable, like MLS. I mean, I tell you every each and every week, despite the separation that is that has happened, it is still the most unpredictable league, I think, in the world. And I think it will remain that because of the restrictions that are in place and because 
of the things both on and off the field that are done specifically to increase and maintain that type of co uh, competition. If you can tell me right now who's winning MLS Cup next year, you're a better person than I am, all right? And you're a hell of a lot smarter than I am. We all, we, we all, we all try to figure that out. And yet, you know, we were just talking about some of these leagues that for all intents and purposes are done already because they've spent so much money. They have so much more talent than the majority of other teams that, of course, you can predict that for the most part, that, that's what's going to happen. And now you can actually predict from a stylistic perspective how it's going to go. And we have a much better, you know, wealth of, uh, of data out there to sort through and be uh, be predictive. Could Europe benefit by taking ideas from MLS? They could. They probably can't say that they are from MLS. And I'm sure that there are, look, I mean, we've talked about this before. If you gave every team in the first division the opportunity to assure that they wouldn't be re relegated, they would all jump at that. Now, some of the, at the, at the upper tiers would say no no but they could afford to do that because they know they're never going anywhere so would that be beneficial to the game i don't know i mean you're like i said you're fundamentally changing the country the, the culture and the tradition that uh that has existed anyway i don't think that that is necessarily going to happen there are, will there will be some things and fiscal responsibility they've tried with financial fair play and all that kind of stuff it's only as good as as how much you police it right but it does. I mean, if you're the Bundesliga right now, you are selling Bayern Munich. That's it. That's not necessarily good. It's good for Bayern Munich, but it's not necessarily good for a league that is hoping to become the EPL. Now, the EPL, while there is a have and have nots, there is still, there used to be, you know, top four, we we're talking about top six now, right? Of real teams that can fight and can win. And that's a, that's a good thing, that type of parity. And, you know, so maybe you get some leagues that do that more. And I do think that it hurts the general popularity and the ability to grow when it comes to some of these leagues. The irony is that we could actually benefit from some of the things that happen over Europe. We could actually benefit from a broadcasting perspective by having super clubs, by having teams that go above and beyond and are given the opportunity to outspend and to be those big, bad super clubs that as many people hate as love to watch. So we'll see. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, my take on it is this study confirms what we already know. Uh, we're living in the super club era. Uh, European football has never been so top heavy and predictable. And, and it's, it's driven by money the the gap between the haves and have nots keeps widening. And it's amazing because you, you still meet people that try to fight that, that premise. Uh, my, my favorite line about this, I quoted on the podcast all the time came from Miguel Delaney. He said, citing the occasional success of a low spending club or failure of a big spending club as evidence that money doesn't rule football is like clinging to a few cold days to dismiss global warming. The larger trends are undeniable. And it's true because when you start talking about this, you still get the occasional knucklehead who's like, well, Lester won the premier league. So it's yeah. not about money. And you know that, yeah, that's an exception. That's anecdotal. But look at the larger trend. Look at the, some of the clubs that won the European cup in the 60s, 70s, 80s, early nineties, uh, red star, Belgrade, uh, Stawa Bucharest, Aston Villa, Nottingham forest, Hamburg, Feyenoord, Celtic. Can you imagine any of those clubs winning the champions league now? I mean, we're down to like, Realistically, six or seven teams every year, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Bayern, whoever the couple of best English teams are that season and PSG, if they ever get their act, you know what I mean? It's like, and so, you know, it's, uh, I mean, people that try to fight this, and you have teams winning their, their leagues nine, 10 years in a row. We had the same number of trebles in the last 15 years as we had in the previous 50 years. We have in each of the leagues, the points records have been shattered in, in, in the last few seasons. So anybody that doesn't see that there's this top heaviness and, and yeah, of course that lends to matches being more predictable. I mean, you know, it's, well, what they should do is they should take all of these big super leagues and kind of just put them all in and where they all play each other in <laughs> a league of themselves. Right. I mean, cause then it would be interesting and then it would be competitive. I see, right. anyway. there. I see what you're Yeah. All right. All right. Listen, um, uh, what else do we have here? What else? All is right. going? Uh, it's really a question, but four, four, two, uh, they, they put out a list, you know, they said, who's the best manager in the world right now. And they put together their list of the top 50. And whenever these lists come out, yeah. whether it's for players and managers, some people bristle at the Euro bias of it. 
And I, I think this list annoyed some people in that regard, including yourself, who I know tweeted out something about it, uh, mentioning Bruce Arena. Yeah, I mean, you can look at the list and it's it's a who's who of, for the most part, Europeans. There's a couple of, uh, uh, there's Argentina and I think Brazil, uh, if I'm not mistaken there. Um, and okay, that's that's to be expected. And I know I come at it from a completely different angle and I'm sure there's maybe somebody in, you know, Australia or maybe somebody in Asia that will say, X had an incredible year. And by the way, this was based on the year that they had, who were the best managers uh, in the world. And so I, you know, I mentioned that any list like that, that I'm doing would include someone like Bruce Arena, who had a historically uh, incredible and successful season in major league soccer with the new England revolution. And, you know, he did it with a team that of late has not been great, we did it in a team where we just talked about in the in the uh, in the last question. He did it in an environment and in a structure that is completely different than anybody else that doesn't have this this uh, this super league relative to the rest of the uh, super teams relative to the rest of the world. And so I would absolutely have had him in somewhere within that uh, within that fifty. Everybody, you know sees that and screams and yells, how could you possibly do that? Well, I just did it. All right. And that's what these lists are designed to do. And I fell, I fell right into it. It's catnip. It's catnip to, to people, including, uh, including me, because you look at it and why isn't this person here? And this person should be here. It's designed to foster that type of debate and that, uh, that disagreement. And that's exactly, that's exactly what it did. So you know, who, who would you have on that list? But when I look at it from an MLS perspective, look, I can, I can name a bunch of, of coaches that had really, really good years and did more with less. You look at someone like, um, you know, someone like Jim Curtin in, uh, in Philadelphia, do they, do they rise to the level of the 50? I mean, for the most part, the reasons why they are, these, these names are on this 50 is because of where they coach. But it's not to say that any of these coaches that I would throw in there, uh, coaches in MLS or coaches in Asia or coaches in uh, Australia, if they were put and given the tools and the opportunities that some of these coaches uh, have had that, that are in this list, that they wouldn't do as well or who knows, maybe even better. Now, we're never going to see that. And when you, once again, put the reality versus the perception up there and that perception of Europe as we've said time and time again is incredibly strong and by the way in many cases is absolutely right in terms of the reality that is on the ground so it's not me looking at this list and saying these these uh, these coaches don't deserve to be there or that they're not great coaches uh, out there my point in saying that Bruce Arena out there is, uh, should have been on that list is to say there is great coaching that is being done all over the world. And just because it's not being done at what you consider the highest level, or just because it's not being done in a league that you consider is the best in the world does not necessarily mean that that is not great coaching. And I know people will throw back, all right, well then my little Jimmy's 12 year old, coach is one of the best coaches in the world. Okay, fine. You want to go down that road? We can, we could certainly go down that, uh, go down that road. But once again, th these are all subjective types of things, unless you want to actually qualify it and quantify it and have a formula that spits out who those, who, who those are, then you're going to have this debate, which is what you wanted in the first place. And that's what you got. All right, Masi, what else? Yeah. My, my favorite on the Euro bias front is I mentioned him earlier in the podcast, Marcelo Gajardo only being 34th. If that guy is only the 34th best manager in the world, then I, I don't know. I must be watching something else. Um, we'll end on this at, at Ted sad uh, one asks favorite soccer win of 2021. And then he adds Merry Christmas. Oh, that's the, I'll tell you what, let's take a, Let's take a break. And, we'll, and when I come back, we'll finish it up. We've really gone long today. We appreciate if you if you stuck around here to the end. We'll finish it up because I will tell you my, my, my best soccer win and memory from 2021 uh, after the break. This is a good way to kind of give you my one for the road here. So we'll take a quick break and we come back. Yes, my favorite soccer win of 2021. All right, we're back. And I have uh, co-opted the, uh, the last question of the Ask Alexi segment. Uh, and I'm going to use it here for my one for the road because... Uh, I was asked this uh, by a couple different people about when I look back at 2021, and we really didn't do a, a whole kind of retrospective type of uh, of thing here. But you know, when I think back to that moment 
in uh, the summer of 2021 with the United States men's national team beating Mexico. And I know you have to you have to make sure that you're specific because of the amount of times that that happened in 2021. So this is in the Gold Cup final. This is a game that we as Fox were broadcasting. This was a game, yes, once again, a final in the Gold Cup against our biggest rival, Mexico, in Las Vegas at that incredible stadium, packed, packed to the brim. I would say 85 to 15 percent, 85 percent to 15 percent L3 fans as is to be expected. And they were wonderful. It was an incredible atmosphere. But in that moment, when that uh, goal goes in and Miles Robinson wins the game for the U.S. and we beat Mexico, something happened. And for those that watched it, (laughs) you will know that I had this this physical reaction. And as I as I later explained, it, it had much less to do with a soccer game, the scoring of a goal, a fan of a team being happy, and much more having to do with the communal aspect that had been taken away and stolen from all of us for so long. And I'm not saying we're we're back, but in that moment, I was I was celebrating and and hit and incredibly emotional in a way that I did not expect about what our world is, what our country is, through the lens, obviously, of soccer. And um, all of those different things combined just just bombarded me in uh, in that moment. And my pride for this country, and within that pride is the recognition of the good and bad that exists, Uh, my love of this sport, and what it has become here in now 2022, when I look around and I think about you know, all the decades that I've been involved and in, have seen the, the maturation process and the evolution of, of what our soccer, American soccer community and family is and how big it is. You know, I talk about it all the time. All of that, um, the pride that I feel for this particular team and what it possibly is doing. And it's not without fault and it's not going to be without challenges and at times probably some failures, but seeing that out there and having that moment. And like I said, a moment that would have been special anyway, but was just compounded uh, in terms of how special it was because of the circumstances of not just the previous six months, but the previous two years, basically. Uh, That for me uh, is something that I will never forget. And certainly my favorite soccer win of uh, 2021. Did I celebrate with a red solo cup is one of the questions that they asked. The the fascination with my uh, with my solo cup drinking exploits over the Christmas break and New Year's break was was a little surprising. Um, I have always uh, loved the Solo Cup, as I know many people out there uh, do. Solo Cup has a, a, an incredible history <clears throat> in terms of the Solo Cup company, and then the uh, the creation in the 70s from the son of the founder of the Solo Cup company, and how ubiquitous it has become, how important it's become. I had a red cup for my Christmas celebration, and then I had a silver cup for my New Year's celebration. I do not apologize for it in the least, uh, I, I certainly there was available uh, beautiful uh, glassware to be had, but I said no. I'm good with my uh, with my solo cup, and I will continue uh, to do that. And yes, I did celebrate with a solo cup after uh, after that win. Uh, as far as to your final uh, point on the rankings, look, this is what happens. All right, when the U.S. is in a good position from a FIFA ranking perspective, we put all sorts of stock into the FIFA rankings. And when it's in a, in a bad position, we say, well, it really doesn't matter. And it's just a formula and it really doesn't take into account this and that. So that we end, uh, we, we end 2021 and go into 2022 ranked 11th in the world, our highest year end ranking since 2005. I think that that is an incredible tribute to um, and a feather in the cap for what Greg Burhalter has done and where we find ourselves now in January uh, 2022, the year of the World Cup, the year, hopefully, of 
a return to where we have been for had been for so long until the failure of 2018. And hopefully not just a return, but a triumphant return with a team that does the things that I was just talking about, excites you, gives you that reason to believe. Still plenty of work to do, including the end of this month where the next window opens up. Uh, we will be doing one of those games. Uh, when I say we, I mean Fox. We will be going to the great state of Minnesota and freezing our ass off in the, in the most beautiful way possible in what is definitely going to be a frozen tundra type of once in a lifetime type of experience up there for one of those qualifiers. I cannot wait to do that. Um, and I can't wait for that, uh, that whole experience. Most importantly, I hope we get those, uh, those three points and hopefully that nine points and put this to bed so that we can start planning for a successful and exciting uh, and incredibly interesting November, December World Cup in, uh, in Qatar that involves the U.S. men's national team. Uh, and as we know, didn't involve it last time. And so we put that right. Greg Berhalter puts that right. And we start justifying some of this incredible hope and excitement that we have revolving uh, around this team, including players that we've talked about on this podcast already. And whether it's a, a Pepe or a, a Pulisic or anybody else out there, there's a lot to be thankful for. There's a lot to be excited about as we, uh, as we enter 2021. So thank you. Uh, enjoy the ride. Mossy, anything uh, to add before we head out? No, that's it. Excited right. to get this going again for 20. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun. We're, uh, we're back at it for another year. We round the corner into 2022. It's great to be in a world cup year and I can't wait to see how it all uh, shapes up for the U S men's national team and for the world when it comes to uh, a world cup, there's, there's something special about a world cup and that we have this, this runway up to uh, November, December in uh, Qatar, it's going to be fun, but there's still a lot of work to do and a lot of soccer going on. So we're going to hit on it, uh, hit on as much as we possibly can. And we appreciate you continue uh, or that you, maybe if you just joined us that you are taking this ride when it comes to the state of the union, again, uh, continue to use those, uh, th those platforms out there. And that hashtag ask Alexi, continue to send us questions either on social media uh, with that hashtag Ask Alexi or on the State of the Union podcast hotline 657-549-2297. That's 657-549-2297. Continue to write and review and rate and subscribe and do all those different things. There is rating now on Spotify, I'm told. So make sure that you hit those, uh, those ratings and hopefully it's a, a good rating. Hopefully we're giving you some bang for your buck here. Hopefully we're giving you something interesting and entertaining each and every week. We know we we veer off every once in a while and some shows are better than others, but we like to think we've, we've hit a, uh, a cruising altitude here where most of them are at least acceptable. We'll settle for acceptable, right? Mossy? That's all I ever shoot for in life. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well said, my friend, we will talk to everybody again next week. And until then, and as always size the day, you like that clip? Well, my state of the union podcast drops every week. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.